everyone to the Hyperloop seminar um, to the fall semester 2023. Um, so I'm happy that still some of you joined since uh, we changed the day to Wednesday and to five o'clock. So we're going to see how this is going to work out, but uh, I'm very happy to see some faces already here. So um, let's start with like the content. So the first half of um, the seminar is actually just going to be an introduction, introduction of the whole seminar, how it's going to work and all of the hosts and co-hosts. So we actually have uh, some um, new contributors to the seminar, um, which is a uh, hard hyperloop. We're gonna hear a little bit later what they do and uh, yeah, exactly. So in general, the Hyperloop seminar is now a bit more focused on Hyperloop. It was already before, but um, we thought uh, changing the name would also help to really um, point out that the whole concept of Hyperloop is gonna be the main object of the seminar. And in general, the goal of the seminar is to um, really spread Hyperloop, make it more popular, make, make it also um, more understandable for um, everyone who is interested and just share um, new the new technology and also share um, new findings. And we're gonna have uh, lots of uh, student thesis and also lots of um, industry partners who are gonna talk about their research in Hyperloop. So it's um, hopefully gonna be really interesting and also um, different, um, yeah. So in general, our schedule is on the website. We also changed the website. So before it was vacuumtransport.org. Now it's going to be hyperloopseminar.org. And there you're going to find all of the dates. It's usually Wednesday 5 to 6. And it's going to be until, I think, end of November. But you can uh, check it out there. And we will always uh, announce the next um, seminar during the seminar. And also, um, there is still uh, all of the old seminars you can find on YouTube. So all of the videos um, and all the meetings are recorded and um, we put them online on YouTube. And uh, exactly, so there the name also changed to Hyperloop Seminar. And um, at the end of every talk, we have a exchange round and we're gonna do the Q&A in Zoom. And okay, so. <laughs> I thought there was another slide. So um, actually, if you look on the lower bar of your Zoom, you can find the Q&A button there and you can just put in your questions in there. You can also um, set it to anonymous so other people don't know who asked the questions. But of course, you can also just ask it out there. Yeah. And so then we're already into in the introduction round. So I'm going to start. Um, I'm from Swiss Loop. So my name is Andrea. I'm uh, right now I'm a, a co-president at Swiss Loop. So it's actually my third year already. My first year I was a mechanical engineer, and uh, now I'm co-president and I'm, and I'm also co-hosting this uh, Hyperloop seminar. So as you can see, um, Swiss Loop is a student team from ETH Zurich, and we're mainly doing research on um, Hyperloop prototypes and also track. So you can see on the Upper picture, there's actually our pod on our self-designed track. Um, and this is actually at the EHW, so at the European Hyperloop Week in Edinburgh. So this last July, July 2023, where we also brought our um, own track and demonstrated our um, pod. So um, we were in very close contact with uh, all of our sponsors all from industry, where we also get most of our, our um, material from, and also lots of uh, know-how is exchanged there. And yeah, so actually all of the engineering and also lots of manufacturing is done by us students. So we build a new pot every year. And yeah, so um, at the moment we're an active team of 32 students. And in those 32 students, it's actually just around 15 students who do the engineering. The rest of them is actually doing the organizing and, and operational things, exactly. So on this slide, you can kind of see the overview of the teams. So Swiss Loop was founded in 2016, where we uh, competed at the SpaceX competition, 
And from there on, we built a new prototype every year, also with a new team every year. Up until uh, on the right, you can see the newest team, which actually the team photo was just done last week. So it's very, very current, yeah. And on this slide, you can see um, kind of like an overview of all our pots. And you can also see a little bit like the evolution. So on the left side, you can see our pot was still on wheels. We also had like the very first pot was a cold gas propulsion pot. So, um, and from there we de developed like uh, first an electric uh, rotary motors, which you can see on the left down. It, it, they were basically like an electric car. And from there on, we started to work on uh, linear motors, first induction motors. And since two years, we're building um, reluctance motors. And we're also um, not on wheels anymore. Well, we still have our safety wheels, but we're actually, since uh, last year, we're also able to levitate. So yeah, and this year we'll see what it's gonna be, but it's uh, actually still in the idea phase. And um, yeah, how can you maybe also, if you're interested, get get to work with Swiss Loop? Swiss Loop is also offering lots of theses. So you can do um, in many different uh, topics, you can do an engineering project or also economics project. And it could be in any kind of uh, um, state you're in, bachelor or master's, we're open to anything. And exactly, so we have topic, um, on our website, but you can also bring your own topics. And actually, we're also um, sometimes you can also work together with uh, Swiss Loop and EuroTube. And exactly, so that's it for Swiss Loop. And I think next up is EuroTube. Exactly. Thanks, Andrea. So, from uh, my side, uh, welcome everyone. I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm representing today EuroTube. And to give you more, a bit more of an insight of your, what EuroTube is, we are a non-profit organization based in uh, Switzerland, and we are uh, considered as a research infrastructure of national importance. So we are backed by the, by the Swiss state. And uh, our main focus is to conduct research on Hyperloop to provide open accessible test facilities. So one of our first uh, pillars on the left is to conduct R&D with industrial partners to give them the possibility to um, develop also their technologies uh, towards Hyperloop. Then uh, as a, a second pillar, we act as an incubator and transfer platform where uh, through these open accessible test infrastructures, we give the opportunity to um, student teams and also other Hyperloop entities to test and conduct research to further develop their technologies. And finally, we also act as a certification and regulation entity where we're working with uh, the state in conducting feasibility studies to allow them to get a better overview uh, of this uh, Hyperloop potential on, on a Swiss and European market and give them uh, uh, supporting information to, to take this decision. So uh, from this standpoint, uh, we are a neutral platform, but uh, as mentioned before, we are focused on uh, realizing the infrastructure, which is a bit what is missing today in, uh, in the Hyperloop environment. If we go on one slide uh, further, um, here you can see a bit um, some of our breakthrough technologies. Uh, at Eurotube, we believe that concrete is a long-term solution for scalability of uh, this technology. So uh, we are developing in-house concrete recipes with industrial partners, which are, for example, integrating um, CO2 capture technologies into the aggregate to make it more sustainable. And then we are also developing um, post-tensioning uh, concrete segments, which would be then uh, validating in the in the coming test track from which I'm gonna be talking uh, right now. And then uh, more on the right-hand side, we also test um, industrial uh, products from the overpressure industry to certify them and to make sure that these products are also uh, viable for Hyperloop applications. So if we go now to the next slide, um, in terms of um, infrastructure deployment, our next uh, target is the so-called demo tube, which is a 120 meter prototype, 
uh, to be realized in the Great Zurich area, which will be then uh, giving us key uh, validation metrics for the long test track in, in the southern Switzerland, which we call Alpha Tube. Um, in between, we have already conducted uh, feasibility studies together with the Swiss state, which is um, allowing us to, as for mainly for a national level, to, to give the confidence that this technology is, is viable. And uh, more uh, further down the road, um, exactly, we are then also acting on a, on, on a European level with partners such as uh, Art, for example, in this case, to, to make an impact on a, on a European level. Exactly, and uh, to conclude, and also as part of uh, Eurotube's uh, mission, we are also a, a place, uh, a platform where uh, students or anyone who is interested in conducting research on Hyperloop can come to. Uh, as Andrea was mentioning before, we offer thesis semester projects, which are uh, co-led by uh, by both Eurotube and Swissloop, also by by Eurotube, and it's also possible to to propose on topic. So in case um, you are uh, looking for an interesting topic in, in the world of Hyperloop, you can reach out to us and uh, together we can define topics also from, from the mechanical through the civil and ending in the electrical engineering domain. So it's quite, uh, it's quite broad. With this, then I would hand over the word to Marcel. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, and welcome from our side. Uh, my name is Marcel Stamm, and I'm glad to present you uh, the Institute of Hyperloop Technology uh, for the first time. Um, personally. Uh, so usually uh, Lucas Ashman is representing our institute, but unfortunately he's in Riga to attend a uh, Hyperloop conference, so uh, I have the honor uh, to substitute him today. Uh, our institute is based in northern Germany, close to the Dutch border, uh, at the University of Applied Science and Lehr in cooperation with the University of Oldenburg. And yeah, on this slide, uh, I want to uh, tell you some information uh, in general. So our institute is working as an integrator for uh, Hyperloop technologies within multiple projects. Um, right now, where we are mostly looking at logistic use cases, um, such as cargo tube, uh, for example. Additionally, we are building our own testing infrastructure and uh, working with industry to create a testing environment, uh, not only for us, but also for research and industry in the region. And uh, lastly, we are looking to the future to develop a network of partners who wants to be involved in uh, large scale research infrastructure for uh, Hyperloop technology, uh, where real um, operating conditions can be created for the development and the certification of uh, Hyperloop systems. Yeah, on the next slide, uh, you can see some of the fields of research uh, that are necessary for these uh, next steps. So uh, at the university, we have several centers of uh, competences uh, that are perfectly fit for and integrated into Hyperloop developments. So uh, currently, we are uh, very busy with the planning, engineering and construction of our test facility, which we want to build here directly on the campus in Emden. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we are also working intensively on the control and automation of uh, robotic cargo handling, which is part of one of our projects um, that you can see uh, on the next slide. Currently, uh, we are part of four projects. Um, the first project is the Epicenter project, uh, where the impact of new technologies such as Hyperloop um, but also synchro model uh, algorithms and improvement of networks are being uh, investigated. Uh, one application we are researching uh, in this project is the use of an Hyperloop system called cargo tube uh, in industrial logistics. Uh, with the transfer center sustainable mobility, we are advancing our research and involving local industry, um, especially SMEs and potential suppliers of uh, Hyperloop technologies. Um, yeah, then in the Hyperloop development program, one of our main goals, main goals is the location selection process uh, for a large scale research infrastructure. And last but not least, um, the EU high tech program, on the other hand, 
focuses on building a network of stakeholders interested in uh, collaborating for a uh, large scale uh, European Hyperloop research infrastructure for um, continuous operations. Uh, these activities are perfectly in line with the goal of uh, using the Maglev test facility in Laten as the European uh, Hyperloop test facility. Yeah, um, on the last slide, I would like to uh, briefly explain that we have achieved in terms of student participation uh, in the Hyperloop port competition and its integration into the curriculum. So currently there are lectures and seminars like this, as well as students working on their uh, thesis, uh, bachelor or master, uh, or in the PhD program. So uh, by the way, we also have an open PhD position right now, and we're looking uh, for a project, uh, project assistance. So don't hesitate to contact us um, on our website. And yeah, so uh, I guess that's it for me. And now I'd like to hand over to the CU Munich. Thank you very much, Marcel. Yeah, my name is Gabriel Semino. I've been in involved in Hyperloop for many, many years. I think it's seven years now to Hyperloop, mainly as a project lead. And I'm currently still a project lead for, for our research program. Uh, maybe to start, well, like many of the teams uh, talking here today, Tom Hyperloop started as a student, a pure student initiative. Um, next slide, please. Um, for the SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition, uh, we took part in each and every of the pod competition with um, our relatively small, but uh, very fast, uh, uh, pods, which was the goal of the competition, uh, which in principle gave us uh, the opportunity to build up the team, build up some knowledge, uh, build up a network of partners um, to to start developing the Hyperloop technologies. But uh, since 2019, when the SpaceX competition uh, faded out, as probably many of you know, and the interest um, of the university on the one side, but also of the uh, local Bavarian government grew stronger on um, setting up uh, a research program to develop Hyperloop, we moved uh, into the next step, uh, which in principle was focusing instead of just speed and the competition on developing the Hyperloop technology in full scale. So everything um, we are developing right now is uh, and have developed over the last years is for full scale application for passengers. Um, so this is what we came up with as a first a step in that development, which is in principle a test track, um, which is a just was a for segment 24 meters long um, designed to to test a technology at hyperloop scale so the pod you can see on the left is designed such that you can uh, step inside uh, and actually sit inside and this is, is what we consider uh, roughly the size you need for for passenger transportation and the, the tube is therefore uh, quite big and also as, as uh, similar to what other tube said earlier we we do believe that that uh, it makes a lot of sense to have tubes built out of concrete uh, so, uh, but there is a lot of research also on, on steel tubes, so we decided uh, to go with a concrete tube to actually understand better um, how this can be used for Hyperloop applications. And this this test track that you see here as a rendering has been developing for many years, but a couple of months ago in July 2023, we finished the, um, the test track. You can go to the next slide, which is in principle the, roughly the same picture as now as an actually uh, completed uh, test track that is now also operational or been operational for a couple of months um, and, and that has allowed us to in principle test uh, all the technology that we decided to integrate into this first test track uh, at full scale. Um, in particular, one, one thing that we focused on because we do, it's very well as, as, as probably uh, many people working in the Hyperloop area know, it's one of the first questions you get is, is the system safe? Um, so in order to Go in that direction already. We work together with the two suit in particular uh, with regard to safety. So we, in principle, we certified uh, according to the current uh, state of our Hyperloop certification guidelines um, the test track for high, for passenger transportation, um, which allowed us, in principle, also to um, have the first passenger uh, to do a first passenger test in vacuum. So at ten millibars, which is the operational pressure, we we design we designed the system for. Um, to actually operate uh, the systems um, with, with passengers. And so this, in principle, with the passenger test, it was the last big uh, milestone that we wanted to reach in setting up this test facility. And uh, that now gives us a platform to start working on a second iteration 
of, of the components, to exchange the components, to keep improving uh, the system, but at the same time to start thinking about um, long, uh, a longer test track and actually a higher speed, because obviously in the first uh, small uh, test track, you cannot reach high speed, but it gives us the chance um, to develop the technology further and think about uh, larger test tracks uh, to be, to keep developing Hyperloop at at at, uh, at the right scale, which is, in my opinion, uh, for transporting passengers. So having said that, I think that was my last slide, and I will hand it over to Hart, I believe. Yes. Thank you, uh, Gabriel. So, uh, yeah, I'm here representing Hart, I believe. We are, uh, as many of the, the people here, uh, also sort of a spin-off from a student team. Um, our company was founded I believe in 2017 already, like seven years ago, uh, by four founders who won the first edition of the SpaceX competition. Since then, they've uh, slowly but steadily developed the, the Hyperloop technology. And currently, we are uh, with 50 people, uh, 50 full-time people uh, developing Hyperloop. Not only the technology, but also very much focused on um, creating the market, so working with cities and industry partners to make Hyperloop a reality. Um, yeah, so on the next slide, um, I have a quick overview of some of the things we've already worked on. So as I said, we've been developing hyper technology for a while, always focused on the full scale um, um, yeah, variation of Hyperloop for passengers and cargo. Uh, we've done different prototypes. We've mostly been focusing on steel tubes. So how can you build the infrastructure with steel tubes? Uh, we've built a, in the middle of the, of the, at the top of these pictures, you, um, it's a, photo of the first European Hyperloop Center that we built. This was in 2019, I believe, where we tested all of our technologies on a low speed. Uh, mm -hmm. Since then, we've been uh, improving our uh, prototypes, improving our design. Uh, for instance, on the top right, you can see a setup where we tested our uh, new motor. Uh, we are designing the Hyperloop to have the motor on the vehicle. And uh, yeah, we already tested up to 300 kilometers per hour here. Um, and yeah, the, our biggest master now is what we're currently building. It's what you see on the bottom. On the bottom right is the European Hyperloop Center. Uh, this will be a 420 meter long uh, test track where we will basically build a big brother of the low speed test facility. So test all of our technologies, but at higher speeds, also including a high speed switch. Um, and yeah, that will be the construction of the test facility will be finished by the end of the year. Then we will start testing. Um, on the next slide, I have a um, yeah, bit of an overview on our roadmap. So currently we're building the European Hyperloop Center, as you can see in the top in the middle. And from there we will focus, uh, yeah, after that's finished, we will learn a lot about our system and go through another round of improvements. So focusing on passenger uh, transport, building more uh, prototypes and then work towards the first pilot. And then uh, afterwards, of course, towards first Hyperloop routes and a continental network. That's the main goal I think we're all working towards. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so a bit more on the European Hyperloop Center. This is something uh, where uh, also the student competition will be held in 2025. Um, it's an open test facility. So uh, it's open to all different Hyperloop uh, companies. Uh, and yeah, as I said, we'll also host the student competition. We can think about all different types of technology development regarding Hyperloop. So also, for instance, spatial integration or different uh, technology configurations. And on the next slide, um, just, yeah, so this test center is uh, built as part of the hybrid development program, which is like a large ecosystem of uh, companies that are involved in the hybrid industry. Um, yeah, so as you can see, YourTube is also a part of this, and uh, together we're trying to make uh, the hybrid a reality. Um, and then I think on the next slide, I might already be through. Yeah, so basically <laughs> that was uh, just a, something quick about uh, what we were focusing on. So I think Andrea, I'll give it back to you then. Yes, thank you, Yuri. So um, on this slide we have uh, so the goals which I already mentioned, but just on one slide nicely put together. So really the goal of the seminar is to bring the whole Hyperloop and the whole vacuum transport technology closer to the public. And uh, it's also, it's a collaboration. It's a big exchange between the industry and the academia in the field of vacuum transport and of Hyperloop. Since this is very important for such a new technology as Hyperloop, 
that we are all on the same page. And also we are promoting different theses and works on uh, vacuum transport. And it's possible for, for any student to present their work. And uh, exactly so. And we have uh, expert talks from all around the Hyperloop industry and they give a lot of insights to their research, which, which is really nice. So exactly so where can you actually follow us? So we have our seminar schedule on the website. It's every Tuesday, 5 p.m. So that's new. It's always on Zoom. So the Zoom link is also on our webpage. We also have it on LinkedIn. So you can also follow us there. There are You can also keep up to date with uh, all of the dates and who's going to um, present their work in the next um, seminar. Exactly. And then real quick there, we have the picture I was looking for before. So um, there it's FNA because my Zoom is in German, but for most of you, it's probably Q&A. And yeah, so you see, you can just type in your question. And then there is this uh, nice window where everyone can also have a look at all of the questions. And uh, you can also upvote for other questions. There is this thumb up button. So if you feel like this is a really cool question and we should definitely answer that one, you can do that. And uh, yeah, other than that, I think we're um, good to go. Yeah, exactly. This is just an overview of all the theses um, you, you could do and which can be part of a seminar. And yeah, so thanks already for your interest and everyone of you who is joining. And yeah, so now I think we're good to go for our first talk. And for that, I would give the word to Daniel. Thank you, Andrea. So uh, after the brief introduction of the co-organizers, um, we can now start with the first talk. Um, today, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Zara Andote from uh, Delft Hyperloop, who successfully won the Full-Scale Socioeconomic Award at the European Hyperloop Week 2023. And uh, to give a bit uh, more of detail, so uh, as you may know, uh, Hyperloop needs uh, an acceptance when it comes to implementing this new technology, not only in a country, but um, uh, in a continent. So for this, uh, the goal, let's say, of this talk will be to, to understand uh, what this acceptance entails when we are taking into consideration attributes and behaviors from, um, from not only from data from literature, but also from people who have been actually interviewed. So uh, without further ado, I would leave the floor to you. Girls, uh, we're looking forward to your talk and thanks for joining. Uh, I'm going to share my slide. Um, yeah. Um, wait, are you what? Wait, are you guys seeing the presentation? Or presentation mode. Yeah, can see the presentation. Okay, good. Okay. That that is good. All right. So, um, well, I can imagine that if you are here, you are very familiar with the hype loop because you're all from the hype community. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but around 60% of society has actually never heard of it before. And um, that is quite um, unimaginable for us, but try to imagine that you are unfamiliar with the Hyperloop and then suddenly one of these enormous infrastructures is constructed close to your home. It is as high as a house and continues for many kilometers, which has a very high impact on your living environment. So um, on these slides, two of the many designs that we made are visible. And uh, I have a few questions for you, which are which infrastructure would you prefer? Or would you vote in a referendum against such a project? Or might you even take political action to prevent construction as a whole? You don't have to answer, just think about those questions for a second. Well, my name is uh, Sara, as uh, already mentioned, uh, and together with Lotte Westig Bruxma, we are presenting our research from the past year. We were part of uh, Delft Hyperloop, a student team in Delft, uh, obviously. <laughs> and the questions that I just posed are part of this research about community acceptance of the Hyperloop infrastructure. And uh, we are very uh, excited to share uh, that research with you today. So the implementation of the Hyperloop system 
disrupt society as this enormous infrastructure is constructed in the, into the existing world. Um, undoubtedly, it will have very large consequences and therefore diverse interests. If people's concerns aren't addressed, uh, they can actually turn into non-accepting attitudes, uh, which can be expressed in different behaviors leading to difficulties during implementation. So for example, uh, longer hours, higher costs, or even a cancellation of a project create this uh, implementation barrier. It is of course good that we live in a free country and uh, or three countries, I have to say, actually, because we are uh, from all over uh, Europe. Um, but, uh, and that we have the right to do something against Vortex we disagree with, as it protects us from being evicted from our homes only to build this weird looking office there. Um, but so, so it's nice that we can counteract changes in our environment with our behavior. But a society can only develop if innovations can actually be implemented. So it would be better if we became advocates of these innovations because we perceive them as something good and something to make our uh, world better. Um, people's concerns of an innovation can be merged into the concept of social acceptance, which is visible here. And social acceptance describes the positions of stakeholders across three interrelated dimensions, namely social political, and community and market acceptance. The community uh, dimension involves the local consequences of the high group infrastructure. And this infrastructure has a high impact on a wide part of the population as the high group stations lie at least 100 kilometers apart. And large zones arise where communities may feel disadvantaged as they cannot enjoy the immediate benefits and while they do experience the disturbance and uncertainty of this big and novel construction. If their total experience tilts too much to the negative side, there's actually a chance that they're non -accepting, that the non-accepting locals will act against the implementation, um, which is a problem that we found no high loop related article as mentioned before. So we therefore decided to research it with this research question, which says, what does community acceptance of the high loop infrastructure entail, considering its likely first alignment characteristics and regulations? So, um, we um, researched it with a mix of qualitative and quantitative research. And I will first discuss with you the qualitative research of the expert interviewed, interviews and literature review. So what we found is that uh, community acceptance is both influenced by social, political and market dimension as uh, visible in this model from Wusnaak in 2007. Um, and so we need to consider these dimensions first before uh, addressing the community acceptance. So the socio-political dimension uh, that was researched and uh, we saw that it consists of the governmental bodies and the general public who together arranged the legal frameworks. And as of now, European Gu guidelines are in development to understand protection of the resident and the environment. Um, however, the direct use of existing regulations is not possible due to the technical differences between the Hyperloop from other modes of transport. But fortunate for us, uh, certain articles can be used as a starting point and others apply by default. So for example, the Natura 2006 areas uh, should be considered during network design, but also safety is crucial. Uh, every meter of infrastructure must be accessible to first responders and people must be able to leave the Hyperloop safely in the event of a malfunction. So onto the market dimension, which is defined by the demand as the supply of the higher transport service and depends on its properties. And it can be addressed by determining the scope of our project to the first most likely alignment and characteristics of the infrastructure. So the initial use of the Hyperloop system will probably focus on cargo transportation. That was our assumption. And uh, therefore a likely European route runs from Amsterdam Schiphol to Dusseldorf International Airport. And uh, so this was the focus route of our research. Um, and then we looked into the infrastructure and found that it consists of two key components, uh, namely the superstructure, which is the tube, will be made of steel segments connected to frequent expansion joints to accommodate temperature-related motions. Um, and then the concrete substructure connects the tube to the ground and is supported by steel bracing. 
uh, operational elements like the maintenance catwalks and safety precautions are added to the most basic infrastructure, which is visible here. And then finally, the community acceptance. We found that it's a very complex concept and influenced by over 50 different interconnected attributes. Uh, this extended model was the result of our uh, research process. Um, and we can divide these attributes into five categories. Uh, first, the uh, economic impacts, which includes assumed effects the project has on the local economy. Uh, the second category is the planning process, uh, which are dependent on poten how potential risks are defined and managed. Trust in a project owner is a very important aspect of this, of this category. And then uh, a large scale project like the Hype Loop will probably have an impact on the environment and is therefore the third category of community acceptance. Uh, the fourth one is social norms, which describe the subjective information someone receives through different, through different channels. And then the final category is the attitudes that contains uh, individuals as well as more project related characteristics. So um, multiple requirements define the most interesting attributes for uh, our research uh, for future hype loop implementation. And the results showed that the following attributes of familiarity and obtuseness of design, integration, location, and multi-use uh, have the potential to impact community acceptance of type of infrastructure. So these were taken into a conceptual model, which is visible here. Um, design split into color material, integration and multi-use were added as attributes of the infrastructure itself. Location was included as a context factor and uh, represented a urban and rural, or rural environment. And uh, finally, the connections are checked uh, for social demographic characteristics as well as uh, familiarity um, with the concept. So now I'd like to give the word to Lotte, who will tell you about the quantitative research. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, as I told you in the beginning, non acceptance of an innovation is not a problem. It's the actions people take to express their non acceptance that can become an issue. To finance people's attitudes towards the higher blue, and how they uh, might prevent construction of a line nearby, a survey was distributed in the Netherlands and Germany. Um, during the entire data analysis, a p-value of 0 0.05 was used, and only the significant results are presented here today. As it turns out, only 24% of the over 1,000 respondents had a negative attitude towards construction near their home. These people are more likely to perform active action you know, to express their negative feelings as opposed to doing nothing. They're even less inclined to take passive action like that although only a small part has negative feelings towards construction nearby, it could form a large problem. Nationality plays a large role in one's attitude. Dutch people, who are negative towards the concept of the Hyperloop, are more likely to take passive action. Germans, who are more positive towards the Hyperloop, tend to share their opinion online or protest the arrival of a Hyperloop track nearby. In this first survey, respondents were also asked to rank how important the four attributes discussed by Sarah are for their acceptance. They rank color as the least important, followed by material and multi-use. Integration turned out to be the most important. However, is this actually the truth? Uh, to uncover this, another survey was conducted. It contains a choice experiment, in which people's real preferences are revealed through the choices they make. Here, too, over a thousand respondents were gathered in the Netherlands and Germany. Uh, respondents are presented with a choice set, in which they choose the alternative they most prefer. A choice is a noisy, multidimensional signal of a weight attached by a decision maker to its alternative attributes. And I know that sounds very fuzzy, so here's a simplified example. When buying a cup of coffee, the importance I place on, for example, the price and size of the cup determines the kind of coffee I buy. Um, these two attributes are, however, not the only ones that have an influence on my coffee choice. Literally everything else, simply down to the weather, can have an influence on the choice I make. Discrete choice modelers operate under the assumption that a random sampled individual would choose the alternative whose utility is the highest. A choice modeler wants to predict my coffee order, cannot research everything. They can, however, pick a few attributes to analyze, as well as the utility someone gains or loses from making that choice. In the coffee example, the systematic part of the utility is formed by the price and size of the cup. Now back to the Hyperloop. Do you remember the question asked you by Sarah at the beginning of the presentation? 
this same choice set was one of the 16 shown to our respondents. They were asked two questions per choice set. Which infrastructure do you prefer? And in a referendum, would you vote in favor or against the construction of the infrastructure you've just chosen? Almost two thirds of them preferred alternative A over B. This is also reflected in the referendum question in which more people would vote in favor of A over B. In combining the answers to these questions into a favor of A, in favor of B, and uh, voting against the hyperloop as a whole, people's acceptance of the hyperloop infrastructure could be measured as opposed to just their preference. Voting against the hyperloop infrastructure and thus keeping the status quo will not give respondents extra benefits. Or as a choice model would say, it will not add extra utility. The systematic utility function of that option is therefore set to zero. As options A and B are both pro hyperloop, they get the same function. It contains the alternate specific constant, which represents the base utility of accepting hyperloop infrastructure, as well as the four attributes tested in the experiment. The betas of these attributes represent the weight someone attaches to it, and were estimated to determine the general acceptance of the hyperloop infrastructure. Overall, this acceptance was higher than expected. The most basic version of the infrastructure is approved by around half of the sample in both environments. The acceptance rates will grow by adding special material, multi-use, or integrating well into the current environment. Adding them altogether, a total of 81% of the community would accept a hyperloop line near their homes. The second model was estimated to find out how each of the attributes, alongside one's social demographic variables, accounts for someone's acceptance of the hyperloop infrastructure. Um, this shows that the outcomes of the ranking and choice experiment are in line with each other. This is important to know, as it will ensure that the conversations between the project owner and the community discuss the aspects that actually are important to one acceptance, as opposed to the ones they think to be the most important. So in the case of the hyperloop infrastructure, color mass least, followed by material and multi-use integration are the most important. Um, Overall, age and gender, age, gender, and nationality play the biggest role in acceptance of the hybrid infrastructure. While this is beneficial to know, uh, the project owner cannot influence one's age or gender. What they can, however, do is take into account the nationality of the community around where the hybrid plan is placed and adapt the infrastructure design to the wishes of that community. Our research, for example, shows that Dutch people uh, place more value on integration and multi use than Germans do. There are also gains to be made by increasing one's familiarity with the Hyperloop. Not being familiar with it has a negative relationship with one's acceptance as well as attitudes. The goal, therefore, is to enlarge people's familiarity to ensure a positive view towards the Hyperloop. This can be done by showing a broader goal like sustainability through its infrastructure. Here, two things can be accomplished at once. Um, as people who are not familiar with the Hyperloop uh, place a lot of value on integration and multi-use. By, for example, Adding, um, adding green walls and carbon capture technologies, the infrastructure can be integrated better into the environment, into rural environments, and used for more than just transport. This all the while shown sustainability goal through the infrastructure, uh, enlarging the overall acceptance and attitudes towards the Hyperloop. By incorporating multiple layers of functionalities, the infrastructure becomes more resilient, as failure of one function does not render the entire system non-operational. A sense of solidarity can be fostered by transforming the hybrid infrastructure to a public space that promotes social interaction. A good example is a Barrio Logan neighborhood in the San Diego side of the Colorado Bridge. By painting respectful and culturally relevant mur murals on the infrastructure and creating a park underneath the bridge, a place for that specific community was built, raising the acceptance as well as attitudes towards the infrastructure of the bridge. So uh, coming back to our research question, which was what does the community acceptance of the hyperloop infrastructure entail? Um, this was uh, our conclusion. Um, it is advisable to research all spatial levels for future hyperloop implementation. And on an elementary level, we found that the most basic infrastructure is accepted by around half of the population and can be enlarged by using the attributes of integration and multi-use. Uh, these attributes should be deployed to uh, make the infrastructure future-proof resonate with people's emotions and convey the product of the hyperloop. People are aware of what they find important and therefore collaboration with the community is advisable. The project owner can increase 
increase the community's acceptance by enlarging people's knowledge about the Hyperloop and by reframing the construction as an opportunity to upgrade the environment. So imagine a Hyperloop infrastructure is constructed close to your home. What opportunities do you see? Thank you for listening. And we'd like to hear any questions if they are there. <laughs> But I think I see some already in the Q and A. Um, Great. Yeah. Then. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no problem. We we can do it this way. Uh, we can place the questions and then uh, can go ahead with the with the reply. So, someone from the audience is asking, what specific aspects of the Hyperloop project are local communities most concerned about? based on your findings? Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, so uh, we uh, chose the attributes uh, that people were quite uh, concerned about, but also which the project owner could influence because there are also some attributes that the project owner cannot really influence that greatly, um, but that people are concerned about. Um, I think the biggest one is safety because yeah, that, that can be influenced by, of course, but uh, not the perception people have of it uh, because something new is always scary to people. Um, so the Hyperloop's unfamiliarity is scary to people and therefore they are concerned about its safety, even though if it's tested very well and is working within uh, the regulations of, of Europe, it still, it still doesn't mm -hmm. completely click for people sometimes. Yeah, I would say that. I don't know if you yeah. have anything to add. No, I think that's basically it. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what what was your reply on on safety on the safety topic, based on on what you know today? Um, what I would say to people who are scared of it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Is your question? Um. Yeah, I um I think I would actually, um, but that might be my industrial design background. I think I would let people um, like slowly getting used to it by maybe, um, of course, marketing is I think a very good way to uh, increase people's knowledge about it. Um, but also maybe like kind of an experimental center um, mm. to, to pe for people to understand how it works or for people to interact with, with a pod or, um, like getting to know the space they they are uh, going to sit in during travels, stuff like that would I think very be very helpful. Yeah, maybe maybe an idea would be to take those people to visit the facility in Groningen so they, yeah. they see. Uh, yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> this is uh, then leading us to the next question, which someone is asking: Are there perceptible differences in acceptance between communities in the Netherlands? And Germany, and if so, what are they? Uh, yeah, there were actually. I'm not uh, very sure what they censored or what they support on that. Um, but I think, um, as I also said in the presentation, um, they um, accept it differently, but they also find different things important for their acceptance. So, mm -hmm. um, for example, um, Dutch people place a lot of in. Uh, value on integration and multi-use in germs too. Um, so it would make way more sense to actually integrate the um, infrastructure in the Netherlands very well with the current environment and also mm -hmm. add an extra to the, uh, infrastructure to make it a more of a community thing. Whereas germs are um, more um, yeah, like loose about that. They don't really care um, that much about how much to integrate or how uh, many things to add for the community. So uh, we, we actually had an assumption about that, that it might be because um, the Netherlands is very um, like um, narrow in space. There are already a lot of buildings and uh, people yeah. are really on top of each other yeah. and mm -hmm. a little bit more space, but that's, that's purely assumption. So we didn't yeah. test that at all, but that was what we thought might mm -hmm. be, um, might be the project. The cause. the cause of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in your in your eyes, there is a higher chance that uh, such a technology would be implemented first 
in the, in the Netherlands in terms of acceptance, let's say. Um, but I'm more difficult. Or what, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, in terms of ac acceptance, which country would implement uh, Hyperloop first, let's say? Yeah. Because that's just bigger, they have more space, it's less dense populated, they just have more room to actually build it. But maybe even outside of Europe. Yeah, that was <laughs> um, our conclusion. It will probably yeah. start outside of Europe. Yeah. <laughs> So that's so very likely. Excellent. Yeah. Then um, the last question from the audience, someone is asking, are there existing legal frameworks that positively influence community acceptance or is there a need for new regulations to uh, yeah, as, as, assure these uh, or highlight these community concerns? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that in the Netherlands, we have the Umgevingswet which uh, which is quite new and meant uh, for um, for governments to um, communicate with their with their community about certain changes they want to make in the environment, and it's actually meant for community acceptance and enlarging that during large projects. So uh, uh, we would recommend uh, mm -hmm. to to look into that uh, when um, when making these legal frameworks for the hype loop and uh, using that as uh, as some guidelines. Yeah, and also I know it's Dutch for sure. I think it's also European. It's um, when you want to make a big social um, construct like this, or also just uh, making uh, building buildings, you have to also um, conduct a um, impact assessment so that you can actually see, okay, my project will impact these kind of people in this radius of the, um, the space. And that way you will also be more aware of your community and the kind of impact you have on your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this makes sense. Um, there is uh, another question from the audience. Someone is asking um, if you have an idea on um, how the acceptance compares, for example, compared to the construction of a new railway line. What what is what would be the difference, or um, yeah. what is the level of accept acceptance uh, acceptance in that case? We uh, we did look at. Um... Other projects uh, are other large scale infrastructure projects, which also um, have this um, um, connection to community acceptance. Uh, and um, what we what we saw is that the Hyperloop is uh, differentiates in its height and it's it because it's much bigger than uh, than a real railway. Um, and for example, with a uh, wind turbine parks, that's also a more confined space instead of dive loop very large continuing for many kilometers. However, a advantage of the hyperloop is that it makes less sound than for example a railway or a wind turbine park. So there it has some bonus points, I guess, <laughs> on the on the spectrum of community acceptance. Um, but we didn't compare our results with um with community acceptance of other infrastructures, if that was the question. Okay, yes, yes. Okay, understood. And uh, if we look at the a bit at the, the the genders and the ages of the, of the interviewed people who were more prone to to or against uh, hyperloop acceptance, so who were the people who were most against or more uh, not not really believing in the technology. Uh, we cannot, we cannot hear you, uh, Sarah. Oh, Lotte. Yeah. Um, I think this was a while ago, but I think that uh, overall, um, older people had a worse attitude towards the hyperloop as well as a worse acceptance of the hyperloop. Um, and I think um, men had a better attitude but worse acceptance than women, if I remember correctly. <laughs> But it's all in the report, pages and pages long. Of, uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I think we also had some assumptions there, but um, also purely assumptions and not really interesting. For sure. Yeah, the assumption about why we did do the analysis of which is which. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And then the, the last question would be, uh, do you see a problem uh, in social acceptance because there are no windows to look outside <laughs> during a travel in Hyperloop? Good question. Um, yeah, um, it is a 
bit of a different uh, acceptance than we researched uh, because we researched the uh, like the not immediate um, acceptance of people living around it and not per, per, like not using it uh, because that would be user acceptance. Uh, so, um, so yeah. Wait, the question was. Um, I can. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, our scope was the community acceptance, so that the people live around the infrastructure and are not the people that actually are using the um, the hyperloop. And the user are the ones that would have the acceptance problems with Windows, yes or no. Um, but that was outside the scope of our project. Yeah, but what what I think is that uh, if people. Uh, because the no window concept is a bit uh, scary for people because uh, they are in a confined space on a very high speed. So that is scary. Um, and if that um, does not let them use the Hyperloop, uh, they therefore do not really see the, the purpose of a Hyperloop. So it it does relate to each other in that way, uh, but mm -hmm. did not research it. Okay. And... Um... Just to, to wrap up, is these uh, are these findings, is there a paper openly available to, to have a deeper look um, on the work you conduct? Yeah. It's on the Hyperloop Development Program. It's on the Yeah, we will we will find a link and put it in the chat. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we have it. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Here you go. Yeah. That's... Excellent. Thank you very much. No then with this, uh, with this question, we are done uh, for today. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lota and Sarah, for, for joining. Uh, we hope uh, it was enjoy an enjoyable session, and uh, we wish you uh, lots of luck in the future for your future researches and uh, Hyperloop acceptance. So um, good luck for that. And uh, we see each other already next week, same uh, same time from uh, five to six. We will be having um, a very interesting talk in, in our aerodynamics. The, the title is uh, Numerical Investigation of a Drug and Vehicle Instability Induced by Interaction Between Reflection Shock Waves and Vehicle Moving Inside a Low Pressure Tube. So. Um, it's actually a, a master thesis. It will be quite technical, so uh, we invite you all to to participate. In the name of the, the other co-organizers, uh, exactly, we we wish um, we wish you a, a nice week, and then we see each other, uh, yeah, next week, hopefully as uh, as much as today.